Woodside Bible Church. One church, many, many locations. locations impacting, impacting our region and, and beyond. beyond. With the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Gospel Mosaic. It's our message series for the next few months, and you may ask, what is so important that we would dedicate months of the next year in order to cover this story? The Gospel Mosaic is the big story. It's the, the grand narrative that goes from the beginning of time all the way to the end as we know it. It all begins with God. It all begins with God. With God, there is no, without God, there is no story. In fact, God is the storyteller, and he went to great lengths to try to make sure that we all knew what the story was about. And in fact, mysteries were, were shared, and, and then mysteries were revealed as time went on. The story began for us with one verse, the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. And prior to this, we, we see God as uh, the eternally existent one who spoke existence into being. And everything happened because of him. And yet, we find with that God that he is greater, later revealed to be in three persons. One person, one God, but three different personalities. God the Father, who was there at the time of creation. Uh, God the Spirit. And the Bible says in chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters at the time of creation. And then God the Son. The Scripture tells us that in the beginning was the Word, or Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing was made that he didn't make. And by him, all things are held together and consist. And so this one God and three persons, all there at the time of creation, and they spoke it into existence, the heavens and the earth. They made light, God made light, and separated it from darkness. Uh, it then went on to make the vegetation and the plants and the fruits. We find that he, he, he placed two great light holders in space, one to rule the day uh, and the other to rule the night. And then he placed in the skies the beautiful stars to lighten up the evening. Uh, many, many stars, 300 sextrillion, and still counting. All of those stars, and God looked at all of this and said it was good. It was beautiful. And through this, through looking at the heavens, the heavens declare the majesty and the glory of God. But he wasn't finished. The pinnacle of his creation was yet to come. When God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. That was a big deal. Because when God made man in, in his image, what God was saying is this is the pinnacle of all creation. And man is different. He's created just a little lower than the heavenly beings. He's, he's my representative here on earth. And I've given to man those attributes, the natural attributes of God, uh, love and justice and purity and dominionship and truth. Those we've given to man, and it was good. And God made man, and then from man made woman. And the scriptures paint this picture of, of, us, of, of man and woman in the garden with God. Can you imagine? This was the beginning of God's working out his will for mankind. And so they're in the garden, they're communing together, and, and as if God were saying to man, all you need to do is love me and love each other. It was a wonderful time. And it all came to an abrupt end. We enter into this true story 
the story of the wicked one who was created a long time earlier as a beautiful angel of light called Lucifer. And he had this desire to be his God and led a rebellion against an almighty, um, infinite God. And as a result, he led a third of the angels of heaven to fall with him. And this battle was going to be engaged now on earth until the end of time. And, and Satan, or Lucifer's desire as the adversary, the wicked one, is to stop the will of God. And so the wicked one, in the form of a servant, will say now to Eve, did God really say that you cannot eat of any tree of the, the garden? And Eve responded by saying, God said we can eat of any tree of the garden except the one in the middle of the garden. If we eat or touch that tree, we're going to die. And the wicked one said, you will not surely die. But he said, God knows that if you eat of that tree, then you'll know the difference between good and evil, and you'll be as God, and he doesn't want that. And the fruit was uh, likable to Eve. She took, she gave to Adam, and as soon as that happened, everything in this world and everything in the story changed. Man who was designed to walk and live with God immediately saw Adam and Eve, saw their nakedness, and began to sew coverings for themselves. The second thing they did was they hid from God. Or a day earlier, they were walking with him, they were talking with him, they were communing with him. But now the fall in the garden was going to affect them. Death would enter, physical death, but also spiritual death in that they had separation from God. And they had distance between each other. And it's a huge, huge effect in the garden. And yet, while that event changed everything, there was just a whisper in the garden of the gospel. The, the gospel mosaic is beginning. Where God said to the serpent, he says, I will place enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and her seed will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Just a whisper of the gospel, but that whisper of the gospel which send a message of hope and triumph for, for God and for all those who would follow him by faith. Adam and Eve did what they were supposed to do. They went and they were fruitful and multiplied, and the earth, be, the population began to expand. And, and then God saw that the wickedness on earth was so great that he said, I am sorry I even made man. And he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. And he, he said, I'm going to blot out man from the face of the earth. Is this the period on the story? As God said, I've, I've had it. The wickedness is so great since the fall in the garden that I can't go on with the story. And then there's a verse that says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God said to Noah, build an ark. What's an ark? It's a boat build a boat and he started a, a long long building project and he built an ark and by the time he was finished God said and now get into the ark with your family and his wife and his three sons and their wives got into the ark along with representation from God's creation they all got in the ark and God closed the door and the rains came the flood waters rose and the population of the earth was destroyed as the rain stopped and the water started to subside and the ark settled down, God said to Noah and made him a promise, I will never wipe out mankind again through the waters. And I'll make this covenant with you. And I'll sign, give you a sign of that covenant, which is the rainbow in the sky. The population, if you approach earth, you'd see a sign. Population earth, eight and they were starting again. And they were fruitful, and they multiplied. And then we read that God had a plan. And this plan was to have a people that he could call by his name, a people for his name. And so he threw one of the sons of Noah in that line. He chose a man called Abram, who was living in Ur of the Chaldeans. 
And he said, go, leave your country and your kindred and your family, your father's house, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Abram was a polytheist at the time. And yet he heard a voice from God, a voice he'd never heard before. And yet he had the faith to follow. As a result, Abram is often called the father of faith. And see, throughout time, God would reveal his will to people. And when people would respond in faith, the scripture says it was accounted unto them for righteousness, for we're saved by faith. And Abram picked up his belongings and his family, and he left for a land that God was going to show him. And God gave him a threefold promise. He says, I'm going to give you a land. And that land was Israel as we know it somewhat today. And I'm going to give you a seed or a family. And your family will be as the sands of the sea and as the stars of the sky. And from your family, I will bless all the nations of the world. I will bless them who bless you and curse those who curse you. But from, your, from this nation, from this land, and from your seed, you will be a blessing. Abram was an old man, and he waited. He waited for a child to be born, and finally, the child of promise was born, Isaac, and a nation was in motion. A people called for God's name, and they grew, and they developed, and the stories were, not, were, were told about them as they had faith to believe in God. And yet the wicked one, still at work, and during that time when there was a famine in the land, the children of Israel found their way down to Egypt. Is this the period where it's the end of the story, where the, this, this little nation of people who are called by God's name are going to get lost in a bigger nation, and their, 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 their identity is going to be, go, be gone, their lifestyle is going to be gone, and their commitment to the one true God would be gone as they're assimilated into a culture. No. God was at work in miraculous ways to preserve his people during those many, many years, hundreds of years in Egyptian captivity. Finally, God said, it's time. And he chose a man by the name of Moses. And Moses led the children of Israel uh, under God's leadership and protection out of the land of Egypt and right to the brink of the Red Sea. And then God miraculously delivered. And God wanted his people to know exactly what he had in mind for them. So he gave them some tablets with some laws on them. And extending beyond those ten laws, he talked about how he expected them to live and challenged them. If you obey this, there'll be blessing. If you disobey, life is going to be miserable and there'll be cursings. And the children of Israel, that was their story of obedience and blessing or disobedience in, in a hard, hard time. So they move on in their journey and they come to the land, just to the southern brink of it, a place called Kadesh Barnea. And so they, they sent 12 spies in. Ten of them came back with a report they'd agreed on. It's a beautiful land. I mean, the, the produce, the grapes, it's fantastic. But there are giants who live there. And if we're crazy if we go in. Two of them came back, <clears throat> Joshua and Caleb of the 12, and said, it's beautiful land. There are giants there, but the God we love and serve is bigger than the giants. Our recommendations go for it. And they went for the majority report instead. They didn't have faith in God, and as a result, they were to wander in the wilderness for about 40 years. Is this the period of the story? where God said, I've had it. What more can I do? I've opened up seas for you. No, it wasn't the period. In fact, day after day in a wilderness without water and food, those people had the provision of God in a miraculous way. And after four decades, they end up on the eastern side of the land that God had promised. The, the, the baton was going to be passed from Moses to Joshua. And all through these stories, you have men and women who become heroes at the time, but their names fade away as another leader steps in. But the real hero of the story, the story, the gospel uh, mosaic, is God himself. 
Joshua is led by God to cross the Jordan River during flood season and bring people into the land and they begin to conquer cities one at a time. When the land is conquered, it's divided up into those 12, 12 areas and they're, they're occupying the land. And then during that time, it's fascinating because you'll see this cycle repeating. People did what was right in their own eyes. It was an evil time. They had forgotten about their God. And so God wasn't going to give up on them. He sent judges to them. And those judges would see the sin of people, would call them on it, and, and, and challenge them to repent and come back to God. And when they did, there was blessing. When they didn't, there was discipline and punishment. And these cycles continued within this bigger story. But the story is, kept, keeps moving along by the love and compassion of God who refused to give up on disobedient people. Finally, the people said, we'd like to have a king, like other nations have. And God gave them a king. And that king was so equipped to be a success, but was a huge and total failure. So that king passed off the scene as the next king came into place. You know him as David. David was n not the unanimous choice, not the obvious choice. And the scripture tells us that while man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. And he anoints this man David to be king, far from perfect. And yet he was a man after God's own heart and God used him. In fact, many of the songs that we find in the psalm book were written by this man, David. And finally, the day came where David said, I would like to build a house for God. We worship him in this tent or tabernacle. I live in a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice pattern. Everything's fantastic. God doesn't. And, or, or at least the expression of the presence of God. And he was, a, he was preparing to do it when God said through the, the prophet, no, I don't want you to build me a house. Getting no answers from God is always hard when we don't see the bigger picture. God was about ready to reveal to him a little bit more of the gospel mosaic when he shared with him the bigger picture. He said, David, I don't want you to build me a house because I want to build you a house. I want to establish your kingdom so that one will come to sit on your throne as the, the, the king, and he'll reign forever and ever and ever. And again, another piece of the gospel mosaic comes into play. David died, and uh, uh, Solomon takes over, and then following Solomon, the kingdom is divided. The ten northern tribes, the two southern tribes. And these, they have good days and bad days, good kings and bad kings. But because of their idolatry and disobedience, the northern tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity in the year 722 B.C. The southern tribes, from whom the Messiah would come, remain faithful longer. And the prophets would come and share with them, and these prophets were spokespeople for God constantly declaring the will and the ways of God and challenging people to obey those ways. Some of them were speaking prophets and others were writing prophets. Some of them were both. You had major prophets who wrote longer sections that we find in Scripture, like Isaiah or Jeremiah. And then you have minor prophets who would continue to speak and challenge the people. That, then finally, after all those years of disobedience, God declared through Jeremiah that the southern kingdom would be carried off into captivity. But, but God, is this the period to end the narrative? What about the land, and what about the seed, and what about the promise, and what about, Father, the, the blessing that you're going to use this nation to bless all the nations of the world? What happened to that? God said through Isaiah, he said, the time will come. I'll bring my people back from the north and the south and the east and the west. The people did return 70 years later to reestablish the land. And they, they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem and, and rebuilt the temple and continued to serve. 
And through those years, the prophets during, before, and after the exile kept challenging the people. But some of those challenges weren't just for repentance. Some of those challenges had gospel mosaic overtones. When you have Jeremiah saying, the time will come where God is going to make a new covenant with his people. And then you have Isaiah saying things that probably were so hard to understand at the time, where he says, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. And then all of a sudden, there's silence. The last prophet had spoken. Is this the period on the story? There was silence and God was no longer speaking to his people, not for a day, not for a year, not for 10 years, but for 400 years. Then all of a sudden, the 400 years of, of silence was interrupted by this tremendous announcement that into a dark world a light would shine. And those prophecies of, of Isaiah, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and it will be, be called the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. For behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and we shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is one of the most, if not the most monumental part, the focal point of the story, as the storyteller enters the story. And the, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, physically comes to live within, with, with, among us. And it's absolutely amazing. And yet the wicked one, working through Herod, is going to do everything he can to destroy all those babies under the age of two, hoping in that mix to to destroy Jesus the Messiah. Jesus would go on and grow up, and the scripture says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. It's an amazing story of the time he's now ready to begin his ministry, and God the Father speaks up from the heavens and says, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit of God descended as a dove upon Jesus, and he's off and running doing his ministry, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 61, bringing good news to the poor and binding up the brokenhearted and proclaiming that this is the year of God's favor. This is the time of the year of the Lord. And he went on healing people, preaching messages, uh, calling disciples to follow him, uh, forgiving people and raising the dead. I mean, the stories uh, from the gospel writers that he'd called to follow him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have, made, have given us record of that for today. And yet, Jesus didn't come to do the miracles, and Jesus didn't come solely to be an example. The scripture tells us he came to seek and to save those who were lost. He came into his own people, and his own people didn't receive him. And he made his way up to Jerusalem. And as he did, he went to the cross. And that cross in this, this linear history is the focal point of it all. The cross changed everything. And Jesus went to the cross and the scripture says that God placed on him the sins and iniquities of us all. I mean, you think about it. All of those were placed on Jesus. And before he died, those last three hours, there was darkness. <clears throat> and you could look at that darkness, and you could look at the events, and you could probably superficially come to the conclusion, this is the period. The story's over. And the wicked one has won. And yet, echoing through the centuries of history was the whisper of the gospel that we heard in Genesis chapter 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and her seed will crush your head, and you, your seed, will bruise his heel. And that's what happened on the cross. Jesus, at the death on the cross, crushed the head of the wicked one. He would still continue to operate 
for centuries, but his doom had been determined. His final sentencing had yet to take place. And if there's any mistake about who had the victory in that, just wait three days. And on Sunday morning, the resurrection, Jesus Christ came forth, acknowledging that God has the power to bring life over death, and acknowledging that sin, death, and the devil had been defeated on the cross, the penalty had been paid, and the justice of God had been satisfied for eternity. And Jesus, before he died, was sharing with his disciples. He said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then, before he ascended into heaven, he shared with those same disciples, apostles, he said, I, I'm, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and I'm authorizing you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stay here in Jerusalem until I leave, and the Holy Spirit will come in a short time. And Jesus ascended into heaven, mission accomplished, and the Holy Spirit came to live in the lives of all those who would follow by faith. A church was started, and God had now a people called for his name and who bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who here on mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in every nation to the ends of the earth through all time and eternity. And for the last 20 centuries, that's what's happened. It's not been easy. Uh, Tertullian once wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And in some countries, the blood of the martyrs has almost wiped out the church. And yet the promise of Jesus stood firm. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And even to this day, where there's a pastor in Iran sentenced to be put to death, this is nothing but part of the plot of the wicked one. Where Christians in, in, in Iran, rather, Christians in Iraq, are losing their lives, and, and many are running from their, their, uh, with their families for the sake of their lives. And it's all part of this plan to destroy the work of God. And yet our mission remains. But the day will come when the church will end. When the church will end. This is, we are the people of God for this time. And this will end the day that Jesus Christ will, will come forth uh, for his church and to begin a series of events of judgments to bring this world to a place where it's ready for the reign of Jesus Christ who will come physically to rule with peace and righteousness and to fix the broken world that happened all the way back there in the garden where Adam and Eve sinned against God. The scriptures talk in, in God's plan about two places, a heaven and a lake of fire. Of hell, and everybody who's lived in this earth will spend eternity in one of those. The redemptive plan of God is all about trying to reach people so they can end what, where God had intended them to begin, living with God, living with man, together. Together. And the kingdom of God that's established on earth will be ushered into an eternity where the scriptures tell us that in the presence of God, there's joy and pleasures forevermore. That's the plan of God.